So how many of y'all can remember that game growing up, the Hokey Pokey? Anybody remember that? One of my mentors, Dr. Steve Harper, uh, retired now from Asbury Theological Seminary, has made it my uh, personal goal, my mission, my calling to get the Hokey Pokey into the United Methodist Hymnal. <laughs> I bet some of you could probably even sing it here this morning. You put your right hand in. Come on. Put your right hand in. Put your right hand in. Visiting the inmates, caring for the poor. 
And I want to camp out today in just one of those categories, the works of piety category. And I want to camp out on one particular item, reading your Bible. Unfortunately, in the costless Christianity of our world today, uh, we come to church on Sundays, we say, hey, preacher, ply your trade, and then feed us, and then we go throughout the week and never pick the Bible up for ourselves. And what we have is a bunch of hokey-pokey Christians that don't read the Bible, a bunch of biblically illiterate Christians. But the Word of God shapes who we are. Uh, the Word of God what, it necessitates a conversation about what it actually is. We could, we could make some observations about the Bible. Uh, it's a book, for one, right? It's got a, a binding and a cover. Uh, mine is a, has this cool little placeholder. Uh, inside, I've got some uh, little notes, go Gators, from some of our children here. At uh, mine is a, a pleather. It's a very nice pleather cover. Uh, it's got a binding, ink on a page. Mine is a Wesley Study Bible for any serious scholar of the Word, right? Um, it's a book. Uh, Eugene Peterson affirms, our Presbyterian brother, says that the Bible, uh, if you don't own one, then you can steal one from any motel in the country. <laughs> now, actually, if you want a Bible bad enough, you can just get yourself incarcerated in the local jailhouse, and they will give you one when you go home. Trust me, I know. <laughs> uh, it's not just any book. It's the best-selling book of all time, been uh, retranslated and printed in more versions than any other book. Uh, and, and it's not just a book. It's a collection of books, 66 books to be exact. 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament, ranging from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Samuel, Kings, Kings, Chronicles, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Limitations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, right into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Corinthians, all the way to Revelation. 66 books that cover many different genres, that cover uh, poetry, uh, narrative, uh, history, Angelia, gospel, every genre you can think of. Many authors have contributed to the book. But the book is unlike any other book in the world because it's not just a product of human beings, right? Uh, one of our great scholars, Peter Inns, says that just as Jesus is both fully human, fully God, so the Word of God is both fully human, fully God. It was authored by men, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those human beings were just tools in the hand of God to author these words. They were His pen and quill, uh, stone and chisel to give us these words that we have. It's fully human, fully God. It's the Word of God. It's the living Word of God. And it's not something that we just read. It's something that we read, mark, and inwardly digest. It's something that we consume. It shapes who we are. It directs how we think and how we behave. As Methodists, we have a high value for the Word of God, the living Word. Word of God. And from cover to cover in the Bible, we find these three things. Community, holiness, and mission. We see God Himself as a triune community who establishes the community of Israel. Christianity happens within community. We see a called out holy people, called to be a covenant people, certain behaviors that are expected as the people of God from beginning to end. And we see mission. We see God on the mission of creation and redemption and sanctification. We see ourselves in mission as Christians to the world, to be a light to the world. And nobody can bring those three things together quite like our apostle in chains, Paul the Apostle, who from his prison cell, uh, late in his ministry, probably his final incarceration, authors this letter that we call Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is probably not the proper title for this book. The earliest manuscripts don't have that designation, Ephesians. But it was probably a circulatory letter that Paul sent out to his churches, letting them know how do we live as this called out, missional, holy community. So it's like an email blast that Paul sends out to all his churches and disciples in a certain area. Uh, telling them about the spiritual blessings they have in Christ and moving from death to life, being one in Christ and being unity, having unity in believers. Uh, he talks about renouncing our pagan ways and living as this new, holy, called out missional people. And then in the sixth chapter, in the tenth verse, we get a, a summary. We get a transition where Paul goes into practical application. How do we live as this called out missional, holy community? <coughs> In the 6th chapter, in the 10th verse of the letter to the Ephesians, it tells us, Finally, be strong in the Lord 
and in the strength of His power. The first thing we need to recognize is that we don't walk by our own strength. We don't walk by our own power. But we dwell in the very power of God. We don't lean on our own understanding. But we lean in the power of God. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God. And the first thing I want you to understand is as Christians, it's not like we're running into a battlefield with swords in our hands to try to possess some kind of land. The victory's already been won. The territory's already been conquered. Jesus Christ was the victor. You should give me an amen there. Amen. You see, and the cross of Jesus Christ, He defeated death, He defeated sin, He defeated all the plans of the enemy. He was resurrected from the dead, by the way. He's risen. Uh, he's been raised from the dead. He defeated death. He came back with the keys to hell and death. So he's conquered this territory. Jesus didn't come to proclaim a religion. Jesus came to establish a kingdom. And we are part of that kingdom as his people, as Christians. But we live in this fallen, broken world that is marred by sin. So Paul says, uh, it's not that you've got to conquer any kind of ter territory, but you stand and you put on the armor that God has provided so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, unfortunately, in Christianity today, we dismiss the devil as some kind of fairy tale. We relegated the devil over there. That belongs with Mother Goose, who believes in this being that runs around tempting people. Uh, and the Bible does tell us that from the hearts of human beings come all forms of wickedness, that the heart is deceitful above all things, even the devil. But from cover to cover in the Holy Word of God, we are introduced to this being called the devil. He's there in the beginning, in the garden, tempting Adam and Eve. He's there going before God to make accusations against Job. He's there in the wilderness, tempting Jesus. Jesus tells us that He's one who comes to steal the seed of the Word, the seed of faith that is planted in people's hearts. He's like a roaring lion going around who he, seeking he can devour. He's like a dragon that will be cast out of heaven in the final day. Uh, if Jesus believed in the devil, then I think it's pretty important we should believe in the devil. Amen? Yeah. So we have an enemy, and he's set against us to devour weak-willed Christians. And it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against each other, folks. Our struggle is not against other racial groups or other denominations or other nations. Our struggle, Paul says, is against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our struggle, he paints this uh, portrait that's cosmic in scope. That here we are as the kingdom of Christ, living in this fallen, broken world, and there's this great collision between these two kingdoms. And he says, therefore, in light of that reality, take up the whole armor of God. See, God's already provided us the armor to stand firm. That's the discipline piece, that we stand and put on the very armor that God has provided. That's the only thing we have to do. The victory's already won. We just have to have this daily discipline of putting on what God has provided so that you will be able to withstand on that evil day and have in everything you can do to stand. Stand firm. Feel the burn. Suit up and show up. Stand and deliver. In the territory that Christ has conquered, put on the whole armor of God. Standing, therefore, and belting around your waist the belt of truth. Now, any good soldier knows that a belt is an important part of the armor. The, the belt brings everything together. Uh, you can hang your weapon and your flashlight and all the tools you need on the battlefield off your belt. Uh, it, it's an essential part of the armor. What is the belt of truth for us as Christians? Well, I find it interesting that when Pontius Pilate is there judging Jesus, and, and, and he thinks he's judging Jesus, he's actually judging himself. And Jesus says, I've come to bear witness to the truth, to bring the kingdom of my Father into this world. And Pilate says, well, what is truth? And it's ironic to me that standing right in front of Pilate is truth with skin on Jesus is the embodiment of truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. Amen? As Christians, we don't believe in a philosophy or an ideology as truth. We believe in a person that is true. His name is Jesus Christ. And so the belt of truth is we strap up the truth of who we are and whose we are and who He is. The belt of truth that we encounter in the gospel. The Holy Scripture that teaches us the revelation of who God is and how we encounter Him and how we be in relationship with Him. The way, the truth, and the life. And He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. 
I find it interesting that when Joshua is going over to possess the promised land, that God doesn't send him down to the planet fitness or the soldier school to get ready. God says, Joshua, be strong and courageous to walk in my way, to stray neither to the right or the left, but be strong and very courageous to live out these words that I've given you, uh, to be righteous as I am righteous, holy as I am holy, to live as my covenant people. As Christians, we put on, we protect our hearts with righteousness. We don't let sin infect us. We don't do evil deeds, but we walk in the very righteousness of God. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. You see, a soldier that's got good foot footwear on is dexterous in the battlefield. He can move around on different kinds of terrain, rock and sea and sand. He's got balance and dexterity, a state of readiness. God doesn't need a bunch of hokey pokey Christians, ladies and gentlemen. God needs some soldiers that will sleep with their boots on. Amen? Amen. We've got to be in a state of readiness to do what? To deliver the gospel of peace. And what's the gospel of peace? It's the word of God. Amen. That where there is hatred, that where there is discord, that where there is evil, we speak the very words of life, the gospel of peace. And how can we speak the gospel of peace if we don't know the gospel of peace for ourselves? With all these, he says, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You see, in the ancient world, these two military forces would square off with each other. And then there'd be a volley of arrows back and forth. And if the enemy was particularly nasty, they would take those arrows, they would dip them in a pitch, light them on fire, and then fire them on the enemy. And so if you were on the battlefield and you didn't have a shield, that was drenching with some kind of fluid or water, then when you would be struck by those arrows, you'd be a sitting duck. Or those arrows would simply light your shield on fire. We've got to stand firm with the shield of faith, drenching with prayer. I had the opportunity to go hear one of our great African-American preachers in the conference, Reverend Harold Lewis, who gave a workshop on this very text. And he said that this text calls to mind the bold 300 Spartans. Anybody remember the 300 Spartans who stood against the vast Persian Empire? They were a military society. They prided themselves on being good soldiers. In fact, it's said that the Spartan women used to say to their husbands before they sent them off to war, you come back with your shield or on your shield. In other words, don't be a coward. Don't leave your shield on the battlefield. Don't turn tail and run. You either come back victorious with your shield or you come back dead on your shield. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't need a bunch of hokey pokey Christians. He needs some Christians that won't leave their faith on the battlefield. Amen? Amen? He needs some Christians that will stand and deliver, holding firm the shield of faith, drenching with prayer. And what is faith? Faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through the Word of God. How can we bolster and strengthen and have faith, the kind of faith that moves mountains, if we don't know and inwardly digest the Word of God? The Word of God shapes and gives strength to our faith. He says, and put on the helmet of salvation. Uh, put on your mind the knowledge that you are saved in the work of Jesus Christ, the truth and the life. You see, we've got to protect our minds. That's such an important piece of the armor. Don't just look at any old movies. Don't read any old books or look at any old images. But put on your mind continually salvation. The salvation that we are introduced to in the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Salvation knowing that we are saved, that we are purchased by His efficacious blood. And finally, he says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Isn't it interesting that the only offensive weapon we get in the package is the Word of God? You see, if you're out on the battlefield and you don't have a weapon, it's only a matter of time before you fall. Amen? Amen. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, is the only offensive weapon we get in the package. You know, those same Persians, when they come against those bold 300 Spartans, they say, we will fire arrows that will blot out the sun. And so the Spartans say to them, then we will have our battle in the shade. As Christians, we need to be prepared to have our battle in the shade. Because the enemy will attack you. He will fight against you. He will attack you with uh, conformity. He will attack you with mediocrity. He will tell you that it's okay to go play golf instead of read your Bible. He'll tell you that you don't have to go to church this Sunday. He'll attack your finances. He'll attack your family. He'll attack your health. He'll do whatever he has to do to steal the seed of faith out of your heart. And the sword that we are given to combat the enemy is the Word of God. 
How can we call ourselves Christians when we don't read the Bible? How can we stand on the battlefield and expect to survive if we don't know how to use our weapon? You know, I had a, a, a member of a previous congregation, he taught me the Marine Rifleman's Creed. Are there any Marines in the house this morning? It goes like this. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Well, that applies to our Bibles as well. This is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I must master my Bible as I master myself. My aim with my Bible must be true. If we don't know the Word of God, then when we get jammed up in some kind of sin, we don't know how to repent as David did in the 51st Psalm when he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Blot out my transgressions, wash away my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Behold, I was born in sin. My mother was sinful who conceived me, and I too am sinful. Behold, you desire wisdom in the inmost place. Make me to know wisdom in my inmost heart. Purify me with hyssop, and I'll be clean. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and a right, steadfast, immovable spirit. If you don't know the Word of God, then when the devil comes against you and tries to twist that 91st Psalm like he did with Jesus, you can't fire it back at him and say, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, The Lord, he's my strength and my refuge. My God, in whom I trust, surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the noisome pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right, but it will come nigh you. You will only observe with your eyes, and behold the punishment of the wicked, if you make the most high your dwelling, even my God, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They'll lift you up in their hands so you'll not strike your foot against the stone. You will not fear the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will be with them in trouble. I will deliver them with long life while I satisfy them and show them my salvation. If you don't know the word of God, you don't know that the first psalm tells us that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way with sinners or sits in the seat of mockers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord. And on the word of God he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the river that bears fruit in its season and whose leaf never withers. And everything they do, their hand will prosper. Not so for the wicked. They'll be burned away and blown away like the chain. If you don't know the word of God, you don't know that it tells you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. In fact, if you don't know the word of God, you don't know what love is, as Paul describes it in his first letter to the Corinthians in the 13th when he says, if I speak in the tongues of angels and men, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I know all manner of prophecy and wisdom and have not love, it means nothing. If I give away everything I have to the poor and have not love, I gain nothing. If I turn my body over to the flames and have not love, it means nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it is not arrogant, it does not boast. Faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love. In fact, if you don't know the word of God, you don't know that it tells you that God is love. Can I get an amen? amen. We've got to know how to use our weapon, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to read and process and digest the word of God. It shapes who we are. It shapes our mind, our hearts, and our souls, and our behavior. We've got to pick up our Bibles on a daily basis and read them. We don't need a bunch of hokey pokey Christians. We need a bunch of all together, whole self, real Christians that read, that pray, that love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and love their neighbor as themselves. Amen. You see, Wesley said, I'm afraid that the people called Methodists will become a dead sect, having all the form of religion, but without the power. And that undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast. To the spirit, doctrine, and discipline with which they first set out. The Word of God is a powerful thing. In archeo in holagas, kai in holagas, prastan theon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was 
with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through the Word. The Logos. There's power of life and death in the Word. But when the Word put on flesh and made His dwelling among us and died on a cross and conquered death and sin and hell, well, that's a new kind of power entirely. The Word of God is a powerful thing. But when the Word begins to live in you, when we become doers of the Word and not hearers only, when the Word becomes incarnated in us, well, that's a power unlike anything the world has ever seen. Suit up and show up. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word and that it shapes us, that it reveals truth to us, that it sustains us, and that ultimately it reveals your glory. Father, I know there are people here this morning that are facing titanic struggles. The enemy is prowling. He's fully at work. And the forces of evil in the heavenly realms are against us. Disease, cancer, sickness, and death. But Lord God, we know that you are victorious over those things. And we thank you that you've given us your word, which is our armor and our strength that shapes us. And we look expectantly to the fact that no matter what we face or how heavy the attack, that you walk with us, that you spare us, that you redeem us, that you protect us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we have this opportunity to gather at the table together, to confess our sins, to get our hearts clean before God, and to accept this precious gift of our Messiah. The Lord be with you. And with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Those heaven and eyes, bless us to see who comes to the name of the Lord. Those heaven and eyes. On the night Jesus gathered with his disciples that final night, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take me. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Do this always in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And now if our ushers could please come down and come our communion.